On January 7th, 1796, the army of Joseph von Alvinci decamped Bassano, aiming to relieve the siege of Mantua. For this operation, the Austrian army had been beefed up to 45,000 men. This was a battle-hardened force, eager to avenge their defeats at French hands. To hold back this tide, General Napoleon Bonaparte had 35,000 men ready for action. A reinforced division of 10,000 was back under Sir Rurio's control, and relayed siege to Mantua. The rest of the divisions were arrayed along Alvinci's three likeliest approaches. Pierre Augereau was dug in on the eastern position, ready to repel attacks launched from Venezia. Recently promoted General Gabriel Ray guarded the western approach that led through Charlot, the same area where Kozdanovich had come last August. And then there was General Bartolome Joubert, who held the exposed northern position between La Caruna and Rivoli. Messena and his entire division were kept in reserve at Verona, much to the general's disappointment. But Napoleon needed them fresh and ready to respond to any eventuality. Each division could hold out on their own for maybe a day, two at the most. But they had to be aided quickly. Thus Napoleon's entire plan was to blunt an enemy assault, force March to concentrate at the point of contact, and then counterattack, driving the enemy back. Napoleon was confident he could beat Alvinci. He'd done it before and the army was well rested. The trick would be to work out which approach Alvinci would take. When Augereau's outlying units were driven away from Lanano on the morning of the 8th, it certainly seemed as though the eastern approach would be where the campaign was fought. Further fighting over the next three days did nothing to disprove this theory. Messena was attacked by Adam von Bejelic at Verona, and Augereau was contending with Provera along his front line. Riding from town to town, Napoleon received Augereau's report that the full-scale Austrian attack was underway. How else could the ferocity of the enemy attack be explained? To complicate matters, Augereau's cavalry had managed to push all the way back to Lenano. At this point, Messena was chomping at the bit, and Augereau was sure he had the enemy on the run. Now was the time to seize the advantage and attack. However, Napoleon was not convinced, and kept Messena reined in while Augereau made only limited counterattacks. The generals were pretty disappointed, but followed their orders. Napoleon was quite right to suspect a trap, now fearing that Alvinci's main effort would come from the north. However, so far, all was quiet in Joubert's sector, only the usual activities of Austrian scouts and pickets. On the morning of the 13th, Napoleon sent a dispatch to Joubert. Let me know as soon as you can if the enemy in front of you should number more than 9,000. It is very important I should be able to judge whether it is a minor movement meant to deceive us. I am at this moment ordering an attack at Lenano. If there are 9 or 10,000 facing you, as there must be if the enemy intends a real attack, it follows that there can be no more than a similar number at Lenano. In the event, Joubert didn't need to make a headcount. Alvinci made it easy and launched a frontal assault. It took until 3 in the afternoon for Joubert's status report to reach Napoleon. Under Alvinci's personal command, the bulk of the Austrian army at 28,000 strong was on the cusp of cracking the French upon the rocks at Rivoli. Napoleon was about ready to annihilate Provera's 6,000 strong division near Verona, but shrewdly abandoned this plan and made all haste to Joubert's aid. Ray was recalled from the west and ordered to sprint for Rivoli. Messena and Napoleon would make their own force march, stopping for nothing. In the meantime, Joubert was ordered to hold at all costs. Help was on the way. Galloping ahead of the army on his swiftest steed, Napoleon arrived in Rivoli at around 2am on the 14th. The situation was critical. Joubert's division had been forced to cede the high ground above La Coruna and withdrew all the way back down to Rivoli. Problem was, Alvinci was breathing down French necks, and his assault continued apace. Joubert had only barely held on during the day, and was actually in the process of withdrawing under cover of night when Napoleon arrived. The retreat was cancelled, and instead, Napoleon took Joubert and ordered him to reoccupy their forward defences. At 4am, General Villar's reinforced brigade was raced to the front, and through sheer audacity, seized the villages of San Giovanni and San Marco from the enemy. Apart from a single brigade which was held in reserve at Rivoli, over the next two hours, three brigades were sent to the Trombolore Heights to the north of Rivoli. Their western edge was fixed by steep ground on the river Tasso, and on the eastern side, San Marco guarded the exits of the Monte Magnone. Overall, it was a formidable position, hence why Napoleon was determined to make a stand. Peering over the parapets, the enemy was illuminated by moonlight. Napoleon could spy five distinct camps belonging to the five Austrian columns, ready to attack at daybreak. Alvinci was well aware that Joubert would be a tough nut to crack, and had devised a complicated series of manoeuvres meant to outflank the French division. 
To begin, the three divisions of Anton Lipte, Samuel Koblos, and Joseph Oxe would make a frontal assault and pin Jubé in place. In support, Peter Kwasdanovich was to move downriver via the main road, and then storm the Asteria Gorge to get behind the French lines. This multi-pronged frontal assault was not actually expected to seize the Trombolore Heights outright. Defeat would be inflicted by the flanking forces. From the west, General Franz Lusignan would set out from Lumini and completely outflank via the Tasso, and then cut off Rivoli from the south. Simultaneously, old mate Joseph Vukasovic was to follow the Arda southwards until he could cross at Cherodino. Joubert would by then either have retreated or been encircled and destroyed. The looming Battle of Rivoli looked like it was going to be a blowout. Here was Alvinci's perfectly laid plan, and a French defence outnumbered three to one, doomed whether or not they fought or ran. The only problem, as Alvinci knew, would be French reinforcements. He knew not when they'd arrive, nor in what number, so we'd have to win quickly before they could be put into the fight. And it's here that Napoleon would become the spanner in Alvinci's works. He'd already decoded the Austrian plan and devised a wicked counter. He knew the ground well, having ridden through here and fought here already. And spying the five columns from west to east, Napoleon knew exactly where to place his reinforcements. The first of these reinforcements was a battery of six horse-drawn guns, arriving at 6am. These were sent to the Trombolore to bolster Joubert's 12. Soon thereafter, Messina arrived at the head of a better part of a brigade. Napoleon sent the brigade out west to the village of Arfi to cut off Lucinon's predicted path. The rest of Messina's division, as it arrived, would be formed into a reserve stationed at Rivoli. As this was going on, Joubert's division advanced to reinforce Vial's brigade. They found the Austrian attack well underway, and Vial barely holding. A spirited French counterattack drove the Austrians from the Trombolore, but they fell to a victim entirely from the heights. Fighting was close and fierce. The French artillery cut bloody swaths in Austrian columns as the infantry projected a curtain of shot. This fire went largely unanswered, as owing to the difficulty of the terrain, the three Austrian columns had been forced to hand over their guns to the flanking forces. Nonetheless, the French fire slackened as Joubert shuffled units to critical points. By 9am, the Austrians had regrouped and recommitted to the attack. Stretched very thin, Joubert's brigades were under extreme pressure. It was all too much for the 85th Brigade, positioned on the western flank. Lipte's division had outflanked them, and the brigade fell back in confusion. To prevent a breakthrough, Napoleon called upon Messina to drive Lipte back. At the head of a motley array of reinforcements from several units, Messina charged the enemy lines ahead of his troops, very nearly being taken prisoner. Barely had the Austrians made it to the breastworks when this French counterattack struck, sending them tumbling back down the heights. With the northern front partially stabilised, Napoleon turned his attention to the developing situations on the flanks. On the eastern side, Vukasovic's advance was challenged only by a stripped down French battalion. So not long after 9am, he was establishing batteries north of Cherodino. Despite being located in the low ground of the Adige Valley, these guns were still perfectly positioned to support Kozdanovich's attack on the Osteria Gorge. Here the ground leavened out, and marks could be found among the French flank. This brewing eastern attack was delayed to allow Vukasovic's cannons to be arrayed, and for Kozdanovich to get into position. This brief grace period allowed Napoleon to contend with his more immediate problem on the western flank. French reinforcements had been streaming in all morning. The total French force was up to around 17,000 by 8am. But approximately 15,000 were already committed. Only the 18th Demi Brigade remained in reserve. Awaiting the division of General Ray, expected around midday, Napoleon had only to hold out until then. But these plans were complicated when Lusignan managed to drive Messina's lonely brigade out of Arfi at 11am. Not long after, they appeared to Napoleon's south. His lifeline of supply and communication was cut, and the French were now completely surrounded. Despair overtook the general staff. Ever the shining example of calm under fire, Napoleon consoled them. Quote, we have them now. It now fell to the 18th Demi Brigade to save the day. As the brigade assembled, both Napoleon and Messina rode among the men, with Napoleon exhorting their valour and courage. After this, Messina chimed in with his soldierly wisdom. Boys, in front of you are 4,000 young men, belonging to the finest families in Austria. They have come with thoroughbreds from the Bassano. I recommend them to you. From here, the 18th streamed south towards Monte Popolo. 
Pinned by the 18th, Lusignan was helpless as Ray's division of 6,000 was formed up behind them and joined the attack. Surrounded, Lusignan held on for dear life, losing 1,000 men in the fighting and surrendering the remaining 3,000 by late afternoon. Gwazdanovich was making a much better go of it up north. Supported by Vukasovich's cannon, he'd commenced his assault on Asteria. Progress was good against the battered French line, and Austrian grenadiers were cresting over onto the Rivoli Plateau. To stem the tide, Napoleon reshuffled the lines, sending many guns to San Marco and Osteria. This left the Trombolore vulnerable, so Napoleon had to quickly deal with Kostanovich before Lipta and Koblos regrouped. A 500-strong mixed force of infantry under Charles Leclerc and cavalry under Antoine Lasalle assembled on the plateau. With astounding bravery, they launched a brutal counterattack down the Osteria. The Austrians were barely holding on when a powerful explosion rocked their lines. French canister shot had sparked an ammunition convoy being hauled up the road. The better part of the Austrian assault force was disintegrated, with the survivors fleeing in shock and confusion. The repulse of Kwasdanovich came not a moment too soon. Regrouped, Liptan Koblos made one last desperate attempt to seize the Trombolore, and they very nearly broke the French lines. But as the entirety of Joubert's division reeled around and counterattacked, the Austrians were again dealt a crippling defeat. Alvinci watched on helplessly as Liptan and Koblos were split and forced to abandon their attack. His plan had unraveled before his very eyes. At around 2pm, seeing that the Battle of Rivoli was won, Napoleon left control of the pursuit in Joubert's hands and raced back down south with most of Messina's division. Word had arrived from Augereau that 9,000 men under Provera were attempting a crossing of the Adige near Mantua. The march south was a tremendous feat of endurance. After two full days of marching and fighting, the division covered 30 miles in a day, arriving on the outskirts of Mantua on the morning of the 15th. They found Provera's division on the verge of surrender. Augereau had already managed to bloody Provera, inflicting 2,000 casualties and taking all 16 of the Austrian guns. Serdurio had then swiftly crushed a bracket attempt from Wurmza, and then about faced to form a strong defensive line at La Favorita. Provera's division made zero ground in futile attacks. This is when Messina's division arrived, and without even breaking marching pace, they charged into the enemy. Hopelessly outmatched and demoralized by Wurmza's breakout, Provera surrendered his 6,000 remaining troops. Back up in Rivoli, Joubert had made good on Napoleon's victory with a vigorous pursuit. The initial Austrian withdrawal from Rivoli on the afternoon of the 14th proved a disaster. Lipte, Koblos and Oxe were cut off before they could reach the relative safety of La Caruna, and in the confines of the Adige Valley, cut the Austrians to shreds. Joubert predicted they'd taken 4,000 to 5,000 prisoners by day's end. Alvinci had not remained by his army in the retreat, and according to Joubert, quote, precipitated down the rocks without any soldiers, which is to be a summary of the affair. Lasalle took on the pursuit overnight and into the 15th, annihilating several more enemy units. He took no fewer than five colours during what was, by now, an uncontrollable rout. By the time Alvinci was back in Bissano, his once proud army of 45,000 was reduced to a mere 13,000. And as this shattered remnant shivered in the Alps, their brothers in Mantua were on the verge of starvation, reduced to eating rodents and dogs. Bodies were stacked high in makeshift morgues, ghosts manned the walls. All the while, the French guns continued to pound away. The fall of Mantua was only a matter of time. Wurmser somehow managed to scrape by for another two weeks, hoping for Alvinci to appear on the horizon any one of these days. But by February 2nd, it was too late. Wurmser surrendered Mantua to Serdurier. Napoleon graciously allowed his subordinate to bask in this well-earned victory. In genuine recognition not only of Wurmser's tenacious resistance, but also as a gesture of goodwill to the Austrians, Napoleon allowed generous terms. 500 Austrian officers, including Wurmser, were permitted to return home. The 30,000-man garrison was then taken into custody, benefiting from good food and proper medical treatment for the first time in months. Napoleon's victory was total. With the fall of Mantua, the Austrians had been entirely ejected from the peninsula. Their only remaining influence lingered on in the Papal States. Here anti-French sentiment was still strong, and though Rivoli had dampened these spirits, the Pope yet remained a thorn in the French side. That's why Napoleon was not present at Mantua to take firms of surrender. He'd invaded Campania. While still overseeing the final days of the siege of Mantua, Napoleon ordered Francois Cucot of the French Embassy to vacate Rome within six hours of receiving this order, citing, quote, endless humiliations. 
Panic now beset the papal government as Napoleon once more delivered a stern dressing down to Cardinal Alessandro Mattei. The words of peace with which I sent you to the Holy Father have been stifled. It is time the curtain fell on this farcical comedy. Whatever happens, the Holy Father may stay in Rome with full security. As the chief priest of the religion, he is assured of protection. I shall see that no attempt is made to harm the religion of our fathers. Casting himself as defender of the faith, whilst at the same time demanding the Pope's complete surrender, does seem quite contradictory. But this defence was necessary cover, as Napoleon was well aware that in bringing the Pope to task, he'd massively overstepped his limited authority. He needed a quick resolution to this diplomatic incident before the directors got word and intervened. So when the Papal States had not surrendered by February 1st, Napoleon invaded Emilia-Romagna with General Claude Victor's entire division. He was in Forli, not far from Bologna, by the 4th, and he made good in his promise of respecting Papal integrity. Victor's half-starved division was already marauding through the countryside, raping and looting. Enraged, Napoleon ordered any offender be shot in front of his battalion so as to make an example. Discipline restored, Napoleon continued his march on Rome, but was in no hurry to get there. Already, Coucault was entreating the papal envoys to make peace. He just needed time. So in Ancona by the 10th, Napoleon would remain for five days, his only complaint being boredom. Long and lonely days were spent writing letters to Josephine and to family, and after that, tours of Ancona's port facilities and surrounding countryside, recalling one of Napoleon's first ever military assignments as Inspector of Coastal Defences around Provence. He observed that Ancona was a very strategically important port if France was ever to project power into the Adriatic or Eastern Mediterranean. As Napoleon wrote, Ancona was, quote, within 24 hours of Macedonia and 10 days of Constantinople. Even now, his ambitions gravitated towards an Eastern expedition. For the final treaty with the Pope, Napoleon was determined to have Ancona and most of the Adriatic-facing papal domain ceded to France. Final negotiations with this contemptible, quote, gang of priests, was conducted at Tolentino, a few hours inland from Ancona, and three days' march from Rome. Cardinal Mattei represented the Pope, Cucot the Directory, and Napoleon himself. Not wanting to see Rome occupied, Pius had authorised a total surrender. And far from the respectful terms of June 1796, the terms at Tolentino were extremely harsh. France's annexation of Avignon was ratified, the entirety of Emilia-Romagna, as well as Ancona, were annexed outright. Rome would remain untouched, but all papal ports were to be closed to British shipping, depriving Admiral Nelson of the vital port at Livorno. Moreover, 30 million francs in bullion, the entire papal treasury, was to be carted off to Paris. Another six or so million francs worth of fine art would follow. Though the Directory was gladdened to have dispensed with the Pope by way of another favourable treaty, they were less than pleased that this was yet another of Napoleon's unilateral diplomatic initiatives. The adoration of his own army and the trust of his fellow officers meant that Napoleon was bold and confident in all he did. And though far away from Paris, Napoleon's name was on everybody's lips. Throughout 1796, French press had reported on all the varied developments out of Italy, though more attention was naturally focused on the German campaign. But once the German campaign failed, the only good news to be found was in Napoleon's continued success. His legend grew with each and every victory. Having been deeply immersed in the world of politics and intrigue, Napoleon knew all too well the power of positive press and made an active effort to cultivate his growing popularity. After the Montenotte campaign, he'd struck campaign medals designed by renowned artist Vivant Dinant, the beginning of a long and fruitful association. Napoleon also made forays into publishing by enlisting the aid of old ex-Jacobin propagandists who produced journals for the Army of Italy and for circulation in Paris. Ever the micromanager, Napoleon often wrote the headlines himself, often comparing his exploits to those of antiquity. Quote, Hannibal slept at Capua, but Napoleon does not sleep at Mantua. There were other more modern phrases. Quote, Napoleon flies like lightning, strikes like a thunderbolt. The potent combination of battlefield success and immense popularity insulated Napoleon from any of the directory's ire. And crucially, as we shall see, it put Napoleon's name top in the list of those who might perhaps be able to support a change in leadership. What the Directory really needed, preferably, was an immediate end to the war. And you'd think after such a thorough drubbing at Napoleon's hands, the Austrians would be all ears as French peace feelers made their way to Vienna. But hearts had hardened in the imperial capital, and the Orlick Council was well into the formation of another field army to send out on a fifth attempt to rescue Italy. 
Many faults may be attributed to the Austrians, but they definitely weren't quitters. This new army was to be led by Austria's only truly talented commander, Archduke Charles, the Duke of Teschen. Son of the short-lived Emperor Leopold II, Charles, or Karl if you'd prefer, was younger brother of current Emperor Francis II. A year younger than Napoleon, Charles had likewise proved to be a general of great promise. His record in subordinate commands in the Lowland Campaign wasn't stellar, but once given a free reign, it was Charles who would trounce both Moreau and Jourdan in Germany. Now his job would be to give this upstart Napoleon the same treatment. Throughout January and the first half of February, Charles was stationed in Trieste, where his army assembled. The quality of this army was dubious as it was composed largely of raw recruits. Even so, Charles was on the move by late February, advancing as far as Primilano. The distractions of the Siege of Mantua, and then the invasion of the Papal States, had given Napoleon plenty of time to plan out the next phase of the Italian campaign. Since the war continued, about the only chance to bring things to an end would be nothing short of a march on Vienna. The obvious pathway to take was through Friulia, from there Styria and Austria proper. No doubt it would be tough. Napoleon was well aware that Charles was in Friulia and Tyrolia, and would enjoy the advantages of very defensible terrain and short supply routes. So though the Austrians were very much depleted, this campaign promised to be no quick win. For once, the Directory agreed, and after literally a year of constraint, finally decided to open up the taps, giving Napoleon all the reinforcements, supplies and funds he'd need to win. On paper, the strength of the Army of Italy was at 50,000, split amongst five divisions. There were those of Messina, Joubert and Sardurier, who we're familiar with, while Augereau was now on Napoleon's staff, having been replaced by Jean Gu. Claude Victor was one recent addition too, having served at Toulon, the Pyrenees, and now here in Italy. Two more entire reinforced divisions were also dispatched, bringing French numbers up to an unprecedented on paper strength of 80,000. One was commanded by Antoine Delmar, having served with distinction under General Louis de Say in Germany. The other division was led by Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, another German campaign veteran and a popular leader among his men. Of course, the actual strength of the Army of Italy would never be quite so high as 80,000, what with garrisoning and amalgamation. So as the campaign commenced, Napoleon had about 60,000 at his disposal. While Joubert took two divisions of around 20,000 men up into Tyrolia, the four divisions of the main force followed the roads east. In the face of this attack, Charles withdrew from Primolano back down the Piave, allowing the French to regroup in Bessano on the 10th of March. On the eve of this final campaign for the fate of Italy, Napoleon addressed his troops. Soldiers of the Army of Italy, the capture of Mantua gives you an eternal claim to the gratitude of your nation. You have been victorious in 14 pitched battles and 70 engagements. You have captured 100,000 prisoners and 2,500 guns. You have fed, supplied, and paid for the army. You have remitted millions to the public treasury. You enrich the Museum of Paris with 300 artworks, the labors of 30 centuries. But your work is not complete. A great destiny is yours. The nation reposes you in its dearest hopes. Of all our foes, the emperor alone stands. He has accepted the wages of the merchants of London, his policy that of the perfidious English, who immune from the dangers of war, laugh at the woes of the continent. The Directory has made every effort to restore peace to Europe, but Vienna has turned a deaf ear. The House of Habsburg will be reduced at the close of this sixth campaign to accept the peace it pleases us to grant. They will fall into the ranks of the lesser powers, a fate already assured by their acceptance of the salary of England. Within hours, French divisions were marching east, fording the Piave at multiple crossings. Charles had expected as much, but with his inferior force could only offer token resistance, so he made an orderly retreat. His only chance to hold Napoleon now was on the river Tagliamento, and his army centered their defense on the fortified citadel of Valvasone. By the 13th, the French were fully across the Piave, but it took them another three days to make it to the Tagliamento. Wary of Charles's penchant for surprise moves, Napoleon played it safe and advanced cautiously. Messina was sent north on a wide flank to preempt any attempt to retreat into the Alps, and on the 14th, he defeated a small force under Lucinon at Serravi. On the 16th, the main part of Napoleon's force collided with Charles at Val d'Assone. Under a ceiling of cannon fire, they simply forced their way across the Tagliamento. Green Austrian units couldn't contend and fell back with heavy losses. Bernadotte proved particularly worthy, racing ahead to ensnare thousands of fleeing Austrians. Charles was forced to abandon. However, 
This did allow him to tactfully extricate his army, falling back on the Yodine. But there was no respite to be found there. Messani's advance had already carried him as far north as the Isonzo River, the traditional boundary between Italy and Austria. If left unchecked, he could threaten the retreat into Austria. With little alternative, Charles sent three divisions under Oxe and Bailic up to Tarviso to check Messina. This left Charles' own position very shaky. On the retreat to the Isonzo, and harried by French cavalry, entire units melted away. With Napoleon established in a forward headquarters at Palmanova, he made good on Charles' destruction. Every effort would be made to capitalise on Massena's success up north. By the 20th, most of the French army had crossed the Isonzo, but was racing north so that by the next day, Tarvisio was surrounded. Lusignan, Oxe and Berlich were hopelessly outmatched. 5,000 surrendered, along with 400 wagons and 32 cannon. Those three depleted divisions under Charles, who hadn't been taken prisoner, fled northeast towards Klagenfurt. Reaching Tarvisio on March 22nd, Napoleon expected to reach Klagenfurt within a week. Reports from the other divisions went well. Bernadotte had pursued shattered battalions all the way from the Isonzo to Leibach, modern-day Ljubljana, capital of Slovenia. And to his south, the critical Austrian port of Trieste was taken too. Joubert had occupied the Trentino, and then worked his way up to Bertzen. From here he followed Napoleon's orders and stood astride the Brenner Pass, blocking an Austrian army out of Innsbruck, rushing to Charles' aid. As per his predictions, Napoleon took Klagenfurt on the 31st. Striking this deep into the Alps had by now thoroughly exhausted his army. And with Austrian reinforcements occupying all the roads and passes up north into Vienna, Napoleon's brilliant advance would be bogged down in fighting that favoured the defender. Making matters worse, his divisions were all overextended and undersupplied. It was a difficult choice to make, but Napoleon decided that there was nothing else for it but to recall Joubert and Bernadotte, ordering them to concentrate at Klagenfurt. The reserve under Victor was also ordered to join them there. Whilst waiting for his divisions, Napoleon could feel his advantages slipping away. Every day hence would be to Charles' benefit. Therefore, if it was possible, Napoleon wished to make peace whilst he was still threatening Vienna. On the 31st, he dispatched a letter to the Archduke Charles, calling for a truce. Brave soldiers wage war, but hope for peace. How has this one now lasted six long years? Have we not killed enough people? Other powers, which had taken up arms against the French Republic, have now laid them down. Is there no hope, then, of coming to terms? Must we continue to cut each other's throats? If this peaceful overture I am honoured to extend shall save the life of even a single individual, I shall be more proud of the civic crown I should earn by it than the sad glory of military success. Only the day after did Napoleon signal his intentions to Paris, letting them know that he would make another unilateral peace. So too did he decry their lack of support. Quote, if I had 20,000 men more, I would have carried the army to Vienna. When word reached Paris, they hurriedly dispatched an embassy to Vienna. Having received no response by April 2nd, Napoleon pulled up stakes and launched a daring assault directly towards Vienna. Unprepared for this sudden attack, the initial Austrian defences collapsed, with Messina and Gu mopping up resistance in the Mur Valley. This confirmed Napoleon's already low opinion of Charles, who he accused of making, quote, mistakes at every turn, and extremely stupid ones at that. Messina's division on point, the army marched onwards towards the gates of Vienna. Between them and Vienna was Charles, hastily reforming a ragtag army. But by now he could see it was all too late. On the 5th, he sent a delegation to Napoleon requesting a ceasefire. Napoleon refused. Bypassing Graz, Messina seized Leoben on the night of April 7th, at which point the Austrians were absolutely compelled to surrender. After six years, the war was at Vienna's gate. Napoleon was 160 kilometers from Vienna. The advance guard was in Semmering and could see the city lights from atop the mountains. It's also worth noting that Generals Osh and Moreau were menacing the Rhine frontier. Charles was authorized to make terms, and this time, Napoleon accepted his offer of five days truce. The Austrian delegation arrived in Leoben, headed by Generals Merwelt and Bellegarde. Though Napoleon was allowed to make truces, he was forbidden from actually making binding agreements. That was the job of General Henri Clark, the Directory's preferred plenipotentiary. But it would take days still for him to arrive. In the meantime, Napoleon extended the truce by five days. Clark had still not arrived by the 18th, excuse enough for Napoleon to make the peace himself. It was agreed that a formal peace would be made at a later date, 
but the terms set here in Leoben by Napoleon would form the basis of any future peace. And the terms were severe, but essentially confirmed what was already hard fact. The Republic's annexations of the former Austrian Netherlands and territories up to the Rhineland frontier were ratified. The haughty imperial negotiators were willing to cede this, but resisted when it came to giving away anything in Italy. They offered instead to officially recognise the French Republic, a truly ridiculous offer. Napoleon shot back, quote, I told them that the Republic did not wish to be recognised. It is in Europe what the sun is on the horizon. Those who can't see it must take their chances. Napoleon sent young Leclerc onto Paris to inform the Directory of these concessions. It was clear that the Austrians were now stalling for time, until either Clark arrived to give them a better deal, or, as we'll get to in a minute, tensions with Venice diverted Napoleon's attention. But the general was quick to remind the Austrians that he was within striking distance of Vienna, and in due course, the sister republics were recognised, as was French dominion over Italy more generally. To soften this blow, it was agreed that the Venetian Republic would be partitioned between France and Austria with the better part joining the imperial demands. None of this was binding, really more of an extended armistice, but it did have the desired short-term effect. The war would continue, but the Italian campaign was over. Austria was knocked out of the coalition, leaving Britain as the sole contender. On April 19th, Napoleon sent Messina back to Paris with the terms of the armistice of Leoben, along with an official request for a leave of absence. In it, he went so far as to claim that he had zero ambitions beyond a simple political career, even likening himself to Cincinnatus. This was hard to believe, so it was not surprising that the Directory denied this request, fearing as they did that a Napoleon in Paris would be far more detrimental than a Napoleon in faraway Italy. That, or they could see the situation in Venice, requiring a decisive military solution. Whilst he was still in Leoben, Napoleon had received dire reports about large-scale uprisings all across Venezia. The whole region was in turmoil and French lines were completely severed, hence why he had been so eager to conclude a peace. Naturally, Napoleon suspected the Doge and Venetian officials of inciting this revolt, and he sent them a positively radioactive response. All the Venetian mainland is at arms. The watchword of the peasants you have armed is this, death to the French. Is it your belief that because I am in the heart of Germany, I am unable to compel due respect for the greatest power in the world? Do you think the French legions in Italy will quietly submit to the massacres you have incited? The blood of my comrades shall be avenged. War or peace. We are not living in the days of Charles VIII. That last recall to history was referring to King Charles' attempted conquest of Naples, and more specifically, 1495's Battle of Fornovo, in which a badly outgunned army of the League of Venice had been mauled by a retreating French army. Perhaps not the most apt comparison as the French exited Italy in debt and absolutely despised, and now in 1797 they were here to stay. But the point still stood. France had a history of spilling Venetian blood. After concluding Leoben, Napoleon turned his full attention on Venice. Tensions continued to worsen, deliberately fanned by Venice. On April 20th, a French merchant was killed in the port of Venice after mooring illegally. This was as good as a declaration of war. Napoleon sent his units out to pacify the countryside whilst an invasion of Venice itself was planned. Headquartered in Trieste, a deputation arrived from Venice. A last attempt at peace. Absolutely livid, Napoleon demanded from them 20 million francs, the arrest of the émigrés and the full exclusion of the British from Venetian ports. This offer they refused. It was to be war. Three days later, now back in Palmanova, Napoleon determined to, quote, obliterate the Venetians wipe their name from the earth. Napoleon declared war on Venice on May 3rd, without the Directory's consent. Brescia and Bergamo quickly opened their gates to the French, and the rest of the mainland stood no chance. Verona was sacked, punishment for having perpetrated a massacre of French citizens. Venice was taken without a shot. Though the defences were actually quite formidable, and the capital could have held out indefinitely with Royal Navy support, the politicians had been so overawed by Napoleon's victories and threats from the French embassy that they surrendered. The patrician families hoped that a truly colossal bribe of 7 million francs might convince Napoleon to allow the Republic to live. He denied these requests, claiming that even if they offered him all the silver in Peru, it would not be enough. Quote, the line of Saint Mark must eat my dust. The brief, one-sided little war was over, and the Serene Republic of Venice ceased to exist, voted into oblivion by its last doge, Ludovico Manin. On the 14th, Napoleon reported, quote, 
the citizens of Venice are under the protection of the French Republic. Two days later, General Baroguet Dillier occupied the city, sending back to Paris 15 million francs and the four bronze horses of the Basilica de San Marco. It would be over 50 years until the Republic was to be revived for a few fleeting months during the springtime of the peoples. Just as Venice had fallen, so too with their ancient rival, the Republic of Genoa. Long had Genoa been a thorn in Napoleon's side, though to be fair not so antagonistic as the Venetians. But by 1797, it was certainly the case that the Genovese Doge and the oligarch families were actively seeking disentanglement from France. They weren't above a bit of trickery. Much of the diplomatic manoeuvring around potential formation of a papal-led anti-French league had been paid for and secretly encouraged by the Genovese. This was all well known to the French, and so Napoleon had stepped up espionage operations against their wayward ally. By May of 1797, a coup was in the works, meant to install pro-French patriots, the Giacobini. However, agent on mission Antonio Salicetti and the French embassy dropped the ball and could not keep the Giacobini on a leash. On May 23rd, they launched an ill-fated coup. In the fighting, French citizens were lynched. But of course, this was a perfect pretext for an invasion. On June 6th, the French invaded. Genoa capitulated without resistance. Napoleon then installed a rush job constitution for the newly established Ligurian Republic. It was a decidedly conservative constitution, reflecting a retrograde trend in Napoleon's own politics. When reigning in the Giacobini, he even praised the old 16th century Genovese aristocrat Andrea Doria. From Genoa to Milan, from Venice to Ancona, the French umbrella encompassed around two thirds of Italy. Though some of these territories would be annexed directly into the French Republic, it would be impossibly unwieldy to do so for all. So again, Italy was to be divided amongst the sister republics. The Cispadan Republic would form the nucleus of a new state, and as early as May, Napoleon was in the process of drafting its constitution. Four committees were set up to write this document, with the general's input of course. The resulting state would follow the French model, with five directors chosen by him, and 180 elected members split amongst an upper and lower house. Worried about the potentially disruptive influence of the clergy, Napoleon personally selected the entire first crop of delegates, omitting the clergy entirely. This new state was to be called the Cisalpin Republic. The former Duchy of Modena was folded in, joining the former papal territories of Emilia Romagna. All of the former Venetian territories in Lombardy were included, and the Republic was also given a western port and a land connection to Genoa, with the integration of a small portion of Tuscany. For now, Lucca, Tuscany, Parma and Naples would remain intact and independent, but encased in a peninsula-wide French vice. As a reward for his loyalty, Cerbelloni was made the first president of the Cisalpine Republic, with Francesco de Aril serving in various ministerial posts. Cerbelloni was sworn in along with the Cisalpine constitution at a ceremony held in Montebello. The preamble, written by Napoleon, promised independence and liberty. The Cisalpine Republic was for many years under the dominion of the House of Habsburg. By right of conquest, the French Republic has succeeded them. It now renounces that right. The Cisalpine Republic is free and independent. It now remains for the Cisalpine Republic to show the world, by its wisdom, energy, and the good organization of its armies, that modern Italy is no longer subjugated and that it is worthy of liberty. For all this flowery language and appeals to Italian nationhood, there's no mistaking that this was not a co-equal partnership. The Franco-Italian relationship was predicated on the need for France to make itself new friends, literally invent them, since nobody else was willing to do deals with a regicidal and expansionistic republic. But this was certainly a far better deal than the Italians ever got, or ever would get, under the Habsburgs. They had self-government, rationalized economic policy, and support to form a standing army. All of this was, of course, a means to French ends. Napoleon actively fostered Italian nationalism and elevated liberals to liberalize Italian political culture to bind them closely with France. And he also wanted to have a strong standing army to dissuade any funny business from the Austrians. Whilst he'd been forming the sister republics, Napoleon resided mainly in the Mombello Palace in Milan. Though Josephine was still awake of vaulting, Napoleon did enjoy the company of his family who were invited to live with him. Here, Napoleon's nepotistic and paternalistic tendencies reasserted. Eugene, now a young man, and Lieutenant of Hussars, Napoleon appointed as his aide-de-camp. Clearly, hard feelings between husband and wife did not tie Eugene, and Napoleon was supremely fond of his intelligent and loyal adopted son. 
More matches were made for the family, and all three of these strengthened ties to Napoleon's inner circle of friends. 17-year-old Pauline was married to Charles Leclerc. Joachim Marat expressed his adoration for Caroline, of which Napoleon approved. Elisa was married into the Bacciocci, an old Corsican bloodline who, much like the Bonapartes, had fully adopted a French identity. For the duration of their stay, the Bonapartes enjoyed all the hospitality of Milanese high society. It's been noted just how closely these days in Milan resembled those of the looming French Empire. Nobles and their plus ones, dandies and debutantes. Expenses were provided from Napoleon's own pocket, and by now it amassed a small fortune in pay and loot. None of this did anything to endear Napoleon to the directory, though of course their own flirtations with the old nobility means they can't claim the mantle of Republican purity. Most of their objections were to Napoleon's continued disobedience, and one former Girondin, a delegate named Joseph Dumoulin, stepped forward as his most vocal and trenchant critic. In various speeches and articles, Dumoulin hammered home the laundry list of Napoleon's indiscretions. Five unilateral treaties, contravention of military orders, the establishment of entire nations, and the writing of their constitutions. The most recent offence Dumoulin highlighted was the illegal invasion of Venice, one of three illegal invasions. The gist of what he was saying was simple. In a resolution put before the councils, he demanded Napoleon be stripped of rank. There was certainly a decent bit of fear among the directory that Napoleon was now a direct, even existential, threat. He'd constructed for himself a base of power in Italy and commanded the loyalty of an army. The whole situation resembled nothing so much as the immediate prelude to the Roman civil wars of the first century. Could, like Caesar, Napoleon take his legions, cross the Rubicon, and march on Rome itself? Well, Napoleon certainly didn't discount the possibility. His dissatisfaction with the directory was intense, but like Caesar, he preferred compromise to the nightmare of civil war. But that did not mean he would stand meekly by and be threatened with dismissal after all he'd suffered in the Republic's name. To Dumoulin's accusations, he published a public response. I have received a copy of Dumoulin's resolution. This motion, which the Assembly had ordered be printed, is directed against me. I thought I had a right, after concluding five treaties, after dealing the coup de grace to the coalition, if not to expect a civic triumph, at least to be left in peace. But I am denounced, persecuted, hounded down by all means. I, whose reputation is shared by the nation. After earning the esteem of my nation, I should not have been subjected to such absurd and atrocious accusations. I now restate my wishes to retire. I wish to live in peace, if the daggers of Clichy spare me. I understand why I am accused. It is for concluding peace. But I warn you, I speak in the name of 80,000 men. The time when cowardly lawyers and low chatterers could send soldiers to the guillotine has passed. If you drive them to it, the soldiers of Italy will march on the gates of Clichy at their general's side. Clichy, as Andrew Roberts helpfully points out, is a veiled reference to royalists in government who congregated at the Hôtel de Clichy. It's also the gate by which an army would enter Paris from the southern, Italian-facing side. We might also note the reference to daggers. Napoleon really was consciously casting himself in Caesar's role. It should be restated that Napoleon really didn't want to actually depose the directory. The armistice of Leoben would not necessarily last, and resumption of hostilities with Austria he thought imminent. Nonetheless, he couldn't discount the possibility that a march on Paris would be necessary to save the Republic, as crypto-royalist Clichyen had now infiltrated the legislative councils and were conspiring with Austria. This explained their support for Venice, opposition to the army, and stalling for time that served enemy interests. On July 14th, La Fête Nationale, Napoleon informed the army of the situation. Soldiers, I know that you feel deeply the misfortunes that threaten our nation, but it will not run any real danger. Mountains lie between France and us. You would surmount them as rapidly as the eagle to maintain the constitution, to defend liberty, to protect the government and all Republicans. Soldiers, dismiss all uneasiness, and let us now swear in our new standards. Eternal war in the enemies of the Republic and the Constitution. Dumoulin's invectives continued unabated, and the Council of 500 was fully on board. Their new president was former revolutionary general and long-standing crypto-royalist Charles Puchegru. With ease, another resolution against Napoleon was passed on July 15th. They also orchestrated the dismissal of staunch Republican Lazar Hoche as Minister of War. He was sent on a doomed invasion of Ireland, whilst old Bartolomé Scherer took the post. 
but the 500 faced growing resistance from the directors and Republicans amongst the Council of Ancients. It was Charles-Maurice Talleyrand, elected Minister of Foreign Affairs on July 17th, who brokered a peaceful end to the crisis. The terms were simple. In a fruitful exchange, Napoleon agreed to back a coup launched by Talleyrand's allies and his old friend Paul Barat. This was a good deal for both sides. Anything less would have meant civil war. Already, Napoleon was inundated with letters of support from all across France, his popularity at an all-time high. To confirm the backing of the troops, Napoleon had Pierre Augereau liaise with Talleyrand and take command of the shock troops earmarked for the coup. Before long, Talleyrand had also secured the ascent of France's other armies. Before dawn on September 4th, 1797, or 18 Fructidor of Year 5, Augereau's force marched out of barracks and occupied various government buildings in Paris and the offices of Royalist Press. The day session of the councils, held in the Tuileries Theatre, were cut short. 86 deputies were arrested, among them Dumoulin and Pichagru. The directors Lazare Carnot and François Barthélemy were also deposed. Carnot fled to exile, while most of the rest were sent to languish in malaria-ridden Guiana. With the Clichyan ousted, the councils then promulgated a slew of new election laws, barring those with even the faintest bit of royalism about them. Unrepentant émigrés, royalist officers and clergymen were the prime suspects. To fill the two gaps in the executive, François Neufchâteau and Philippe Merlin were made directors. They joined Paul Borat, Louis Revelier le pau and Jean-François Roubel, a full deck now indebted to Napoleon for pulling through in their hour of need. Word got back to him pretty quick about how successful the coup Fructidor had been, and when regaled with all the saucy details, Napoleon was all ears. This was the honeymoon period. Within weeks, the Directory and Napoleon would again be embroiled in a cold war. But for now, Napoleon's main focus was on the more immediate peace talks being held with the Austrians in Campo Formio. Initially, the French delegation had been headed by Henri Clark, but of course, after Carnot's ouster, Clark was also dismissed leaving Napoleon to take over. And though Napoleon had a tolerance for a great many things, blood, hours of toil, the nitty gritty of law and policy making, he had no stomach whatsoever for dickheads. But that's just who the Austrians had decided to send to Friuli to negotiate. A deliberately incompetent team meant as a deliberate snub. Negotiations with the decidedly anti-French Count Ludwig von Kabenzel and the arrogant Marquis de Gallo went nowhere fast. After only two days, on September 6th, Napoleon delivered a pessimistic report to Talleyrand. It would be impossible to carry on with so weighty a discussion with more timid negotiators, worse logicians, or men less influential within their own court. They are satisfied to say merely, these are our instructions, whereby they believe their task fulfilled. Yesterday, they demanded Romagna, Mantua, and all of Venice. I asked them how many miles their army was from Paris, angry at the impertinence of their proposals. I reminded them in private conversations that I am not one for bluffs, and my army was only two weeks from Vienna. Napoleon was deadly serious about these threats. The next day, on the 7th, he gave orders for the army to be ready to move by the 24th, two weeks' time. These moves left the Austrians unfazed, so Napoleon sent Dumas' cavalry ahead to underscore his point. Unimaginative and limp-wristed Austrian negotiating, Napoleon interpreted as a play for time until they put another army in the field. Preparing for the worst, Napoleon was still writing his supplies and the directory, demanding provisions for the army. In truth, the Austrians were delaying in hopes that their royalist counterparts among the French legislature could gain more sway. Though the coup of Fructidor had occurred on September 4th, it took almost a month for the full extent of the purge to become apparent. Going into October, the Austrians changed their tune. Cobenzel finally donned the demeanor of a serious diplomat, but he and Napoleon could still agree on little. The French were dominant, And yet, Cabenzel demanded a return of so much territory, it would practically negate the gains of the war. But if the Austrians agreed to recognise French gains on the Rhineland and in Italy, Napoleon promised the prime real estate of Venezia, all their Adriatic possessions, and compensation for the lost Rhineland territories. As good a deal as the Austrians were ever going to get. Cabenzel still held out for better. I cannot understate just how pissed Napoleon was. According to one associate, his letters back to Talleyrand grew increasingly exasperated and hyperbolic. As was often the case when Napoleon was in such a state, he lashed out, blaming the Italians, blaming the directory, blaming the diplomats. Letters home do seem to have relieved some pressure, and Talleyrand did put on a good correspondence with Napoleon, offering sage advice. 
This was the origin of their very complicated relationship, which shaped French foreign policy for the next 20 years. Another comfort was Napoleon's old friend, Louis Bourrienne. He'd been called upon to serve as Napoleon's secretary just after Fructidor, and they'd be side by side for the next few years until, much like with Talleyrand, a truly spectacular falling out. At the negotiations, deadlock was only broken by the threat of force. On October 6th, Napoleon again mobilised his army. This was likely a bluff, as the first winter snows were now falling, but Austria couldn't take the chance. On the 10th, when Napoleon delivered a final ultimatum, Cabenzel gave way. Over the next week, the fine details were hashed out, and on October 17th, 1797, a treaty was signed in the village of Campo Formio. We're pretty well across the territorial shifts, so we'll go over the secret clauses. Spheres of influence were decided. Everything west of the Rhine and the Adige was to be French. Everything east was Austrian. As per this arrangement, Switzerland, as the middle ground between the two, was admitted into the French sphere. Austria nominally agreed to turn a blind eye to French ambitions in the region. Furthermore, an imperial diet would be convened in Rastatt to a. get the rest of the empire on board with Campo Formio, and b. allow the French to reaffirm Austrian hegemony. Even if he did not respect it, Napoleon was not about to shatter the Holy Roman Empire. The terms were conveyed to Talleyrand on the 18th. Quote, Peace was signed an hour after midnight. There will be much carping and criticism, I'm sure. Berthier was sent off with a full copy in hand. Campo Formio definitively ended the Italian campaign. The fighting had been nearly as arduous as the peace. But with the campaign over, attentions could be turned towards other pressing matters. We've already had hints as to where Napoleon's gaze was now fixed. Across the Mediterranean, the Orient beckoned. Like Caesar and Alexander, Napoleon's path would take him east, to Egypt and the Levant. <laughs>